research at Sit Plain, also known as Malspina Glacier. My name is Kristen Tim. I'm from the International Arctic Research Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And this is a recorded version of a presentation that was originally given in April of 2023 in Yakutat, Alaska. I'd like to acknowledge that I'll be presenting today with Martin Trufer from the Geophysical Institute at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And I'd also like to acknowledge our partner in research, Mike Loso from the National Park Service, who helped develop this presentation. So before we um, get far into the presentation, um, I'd like to just share a little bit about myself. So I'm a social scientist at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and I am a relatively early career scientist. Um, I spent a long time working in science education and science communication. And my interest in these topics really started around the glaciers of South Central Alaska. Um, after my first year of college, I came to Alaska in uh, 2001 um, to work at the Portage Glacier Visitor Center, which is near Anchorage, Alaska. And that's really what interested me in glaciers and how we communicate about changing glaciers. And now I conduct research related to how we communicate science and how people understand scientific information and make decisions about it. Hi, I also just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Martin Trufer. I'm a glaciologist at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. I originally actually do not come from Alaska. I grew up in Switzerland in a very small town, even smaller than Yakutat, uh, with about 200 people. Um, but it had the uh, advantage of being situated very near a glacier. So I got fascinated by glaciers from an early age. And when I had the opportunity to actually come to Alaska and see the real thing, the really big glaciers, not the tiny ones in the Alps, um, I took that opportunity to come to graduate school in Fairbanks. And uh, I came here for five years, and that was almost 30 years ago. So um, I got stuck here, and I love it. I tend to spend a lot of time um, in, in the mountains, especially around here as well. I've had the opportunity to come to Yakutat the first time in 2000, I believe. And then again, in 2002, we actually organized a big international meeting here that some people in the audience might actually remember. Uh, we had over 100 people from all over the world here that study glaciers as a living. And uh, when they got to see this place, we did a midweek flight seeing trip uh, out over Yakutak Glacier, Hubbard Glacier, um, following up to Turner down the Malaspina. And that was a, a real treat for a lot of these people. Um, so I've, I've had I've had been able to come to Yakutat a few times. Um, I think it's one of the most fascinating areas in the world that I've ever seen, um, especially for somebody who studies the earth and how things are changing. So when we talk about the Malaspina Glacier, one of the reasons scientifically that drew our attention to it is just a look at a map, basically. If you if you look at this map here, if we look at the uh, Malaspina, or as I should say, the Sit Plain Glacier located here, it's a whole lot of ice that's sitting right at the foot of the mountain here. As a matter of fact, Malis or uh, the glacier is often called the Piemont Glacier, um, Piemont, the meaning of that word means foot of the mountain, and the reason is because it just sticks. This glacier originates up here in the mountain, and it sticks its foot way out towards the ocean here. But what's so special about this glacier is that the glaciers adjacent to it don't do that. If you go into Icy Bay, which many of you are very familiar with, the ice is retreated all the way back here. If you go into Yakutat and Disenchantment Bay, um, you see that the Hubbard Glacier here is retreated way up the fjord. Now, it turns out it didn't uh, used to be that way. These glaciers used to be advanced all the way out to the coast here a long time ago. In the case of Icy Bay, perhaps not so long ago, uh, some of the older people in Yakutat remember the opening of this bay and or certainly remember uh, hearing stories about it from their parents. 
but this glacier is still here so why is that what makes it so special um and what's the potential for this ice to be lost and what would that mean for the landscape of this area here and of Alaska in general and the uh, um, all the implications that brings with it uh, for ecosystems and the change of how the land is used. So this is just another view um, of it. It's just a map that I really like, so I just wanted to throw that into the presentation. Uh, I also tried to put uh, some of the native names back into the glaciology. We, we try to um, be a bit more cognizant of that than we used to be. Uh, it's really quite preposterous, really, that the white man arrives and starts naming everything that already has names. So our understanding is that what we call the Malaspina Glacier is actually known as the Sit Plain, uh, which means the big glacier, which is certainly appropriate. And we just had some really interesting conversations uh, with elders here in Yakutat about the fact that the Hubbard Glacier um, is also named the Sith Plain. And uh, one thing we heard is like, well, the reason it's named the same thing is because it's the same glacier. And we heard stories about uh, glacier ice coming all the way out to the coast, all the way from up uh, in Icy Bay down to Yakutat. And indeed, there is a lot of geological evidence that that was once uh, the case. So the reason these glaciers are named the same, which initially was a bit perplexing to us, is because they are the same glacier, or at least they were. Um, so that that's actually, that was really neat to hear that. So why, I, I, I throw this slide in um, often for people, when I talk to people outside Alaska, because generally the expectation is that the place where you would find glaciers is the further north you go, right? You go north, it gets cold, and when it's cold, you get ice and so on. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, where I live in Fairbanks, we haven't had ice in a long time, or we have it every year, but it goes away. And uh, even during the last glacial maximum, so, you know, when we go 14, 15,000 years ago, there was no ice in, in Fairbanks um, or no ice sheet. So why is the ice in the south in Alaska? It's not because it's particularly cold. Um, it's because there are very high mountains sitting there, as you as you know, right outside your door. And then you have this huge moisture source, the uh, Pacific Ocean. So this is dumping moisture right onto the continent here. And these mountains capture all that moisture and turn it into ice. And they keep the land behind it relatively dry. So when you go from Yakutat, which is the town in the United States with the most recorded rainfall, into something like McCarthy, which is right across the mountains here, not very far, um, you on a distance of maybe 100 miles or so, you get 10 times less precipitation. So these mountains capture all that precipitation, and then the ice uh, flows back towards the ocean or some of it uh, into the interior. This is just to give you a little bit of an impression of how this glacier looks like uh, from the air. Uh, I imagine that a lot of you see it maybe from kind of jet altitude when you fly out of Yakutat, or it's not very easy to see from the land because it's so big when you're on the coast. But this is an impression just flying towards Mount St. Elias. This is a GoPro camera that is mounted on a strap of an airplane. And it just gives, I think it gives a really nice impression, I'll play it again, of how big this landscape is. Here's the Malaspina Lake that you might be familiar with. And then this enormous lobe that's the size of one of the smaller states, uh, just sitting right there on the coastal plain and coming, being fed from snow that's being captured here at Mount St. Elias and uh, all the other big mountains of the area. So moving on here, I'll show you some pictures of the kind of work we've done up there because it's so big, it's really hard to do anything on foot. So we've been able to access places uh, with helicopters, uh, working here with the Akata Coast Lair with Hans Munich. And as you can see, it can be quite challenges, uh, challenging. This is uh, sometime later in the summer when we came back to remeasure some stakes. This is one of our grad students, Victor, um, who's measuring how much a stake is sticking out of the ice. Um, certainly very challenging in terms of getting there and landing on the ice. This is an impression uh, without the helicopter, but 
just how much things are melting. So when we installed these stations, this is a GPS station. The little dish you see here on top is an antenna, and it can record very precisely the motion of the glacier. This pole here is 10 feet high. So when we drilled this in in the, in the spring, this antenna was sitting right on the surface of the glacier. And when we come back, um, more than 10 feet has, has melted out. Um, so the whole surface here, this is hard to imagine when you're standing here, but the whole surface used to be up here in the spring, and now it's down here. We also put up weather stations uh, with various luck. The uh, uh, environment here is very, very harsh, so we've actually lost a lot of instruments due to high wind, um, and uh, in this case also due to avalanching in the winter. We put cameras out to watch the glacier move and uh, see how the snow line moves, things like that. And uh, yeah, so what are we doing with all these data that we're gathering? We're measuring melt, we're measuring how fast it moves, uh, what the weather is, and so on. Well, we're looking, I was telling you, we we're interested in whether this glacier can retreat rapidly or not. So as a glaciologist, kind of our red flags for a potential rapid retreat are a few things. One is, uh, this is not rocket science, we look for high rates of thinning. So if the glacier is getting thinner every year, well, then it goes to reason that at some point it's not going to be there anymore. Uh, the other thing we're looking for is whether the glacial glacier is retreating at the front. And one of the telltale signs of rapid retreat is if the front is in contact with water. So we're particularly interested in the formation of lakes in front of the glacier and a particular uh, a particularly vulnerable situation arises if the uh, glacier is in contact with ocean water. Then the retreat can go really quite rapidly. The other thing we're looking for is where the bottom of the ice is. Uh, so if that's deeply bedded or, or, or not so deeply bedded. The deeper bedded it is, um, the more vulnerable, the more sensitive it becomes to retreat. And you can kind of get runaway effects sometimes. Let me just go back here. It just took a while to load. Um, this is uh, getting at the question, the last one I posed there, the deep bedded glacier. The way you figure that out is um, you fly a radar over the ice. We have a very special, specially designed radar um, in collaboration with the University of Arizona, actually. And what we do is we fly a plane. This is uh, out of Ultima Thule. Uh, we fly a single water. They have uh, um, a nice airplane that's good for this purpose. And we just fly it back and forth across this glacier for hours and hours on end. And with that radar, we can see right through the ice to the bottom of it. We measure how long the signal takes to get back from the bottom of the glacier. And that tells us how deep it is. And what we found, this is actually something that we just published recently, is that much of that glacier bed is situated below sea level. So everything that's blue, in the colors here, if you take the ice away, this is uh, areas that are going to be water covered. The And the dark blue ones here, just to give you an impression, I'm using metric units here, but the very darkest colors here are minus 450 meters. So this is about 1,500 feet below sea level. So you see these really deep channels here, a little bit shallower on the east side. The channel, actually the deepest channel, emerges from the mountains here. Uh, it's this glacier here, and it goes right out to the front where uh, some of you might be who were familiar with the area. This is the fountain stream. Um, this is where recently there was a really rapid advance of ice that I'll uh, get to in a little bit. And there's some other channels here, but these are pretty deep channels. Um, so as I said, over a thousand feet below sea level. So we have one box check. There is a deep bed, um, makes it vulnerable to retreat. What about thinning? We have a lot of data on thinning. Here's just one example from when we flew those radar flights. This is the kind of grid we flew. So we just went back and forth across that glacier many times. And when we compared that to an earlier map that came was made actually with uh, satellites in 2002, over the 20 year time scale, if we take the amount that the surface has lowered and we divide that by by the number of years, we get a change um, per year. And what we see is that these really dark red colors are changes that go into uh, uh, the area of 10 meters per year. So this is over 30 feet. So this is the, you know, the, the height of the auditorium here. Um, 
of change every single year that you lose over that entire glacier. It's a little bit less when you go up higher, but this is kind of the order of magnitude. So many feet per year of ice that is lost. So this glacier, even though it hasn't retreated much, it's still sitting out here on this coastal plain. It is getting very rapidly thinner. Then what about the lake story? Well, that's the other thing we see. Um, and actually, one of the things that motivated us to write the proposal to the National Science Foundation is the development of things like this lagoon here and this lake here. Um, these lakes, it's a little hard to see here, but these different colored lines show lake shorelines um, as they were picked out in satellite imagery. And what you see is that this over the satellite record, so this is the last 30 years or so, this lagoon here didn't exist at all, or it was just very, very small, and it has opened up. This lake here didn't exist, and it's opened up over the last decade or so. Um, these things are, this picture is already old. This lake here is almost connected to uh, a smaller lake here now. Uh, so this is a rapidly changing situation. So we certainly have the water eating back into this, um, into this ice cover. And some of it is ocean water. I can show you that here. We can like, prove you that some of it is ocean water. One thing we did, um, this was in collaboration with a national park, Mike Loso let that work, is to go into uh, many of the lakes or into uh, several of these lakes and measure whether it's salty or not. So this is a graph here that just shows depth of the lake on the, uh, the y-axis, where you see some of these lakes are quite deep, 80 meters deep. And on the on the x-axis here, it shows whether it's salty or not. So most of these lakes are not. They're, they're freshwater. But um, one in particular, this lagoon here, Sitkagi Lagoon, um, is very salty, almost at the level of normal ocean water. So what we know now is that occasionally uh, at high tides or during storm surges, salt water makes it into this lagoon. We can also do the same thing with temperatures. This is a little bit more complicated to look at here. But what we see is that this Sitkagi Lagoon and all the others, they're actually, you know, they're at temperatures near the top here between three and five degrees Celsius. So this is not, you know, maybe the thing you want to necessarily go swimming in unless you like that sort of stuff. Uh, three degrees Celsius is uh, 38 Fahrenheit. But as far as ice is concerned, this is warm water. This is plenty warm to melt ice. So we have warm water. We have rapidly growing lakes. And uh, some of them, at least one of them, is already connected to, to ocean water. We also see a lot of changes. This is a surficial geology map that the National Park Service just published and uh, or is about to publish. And it shows some of the uh, uh, outlet streams that are happening here. And I know people in the area have walked around along the beaches here and have noticed large changes in the streams. Some of them are um, some of them are consistent year from year, others are not. We can go back. This is a map that was compiled around the turn of the previous century, the International Boundary Condition map, Commission map, and it shows um, many of the streams. Some of them have entirely disappeared. Some of them like Fountain Stream and so on, Alder Stream over here, those are pretty consistent. Uh, at this time, the Malaspina Lake, the big lake, didn't exist at all yet. Um, so there's large changes here in the forelands, even though if you look from high up, you might not appreciate it so much. But those of you who are on the ground looking at it, the forelands here are constantly changing. This is just another view where you see the streams really nicely. You also see which ones carry out sediment into the ocean because it leaves that, that plume here. Some, some of these here, the sediment gets caught in the lakes before it makes it out. Same here. So when we look at the flow of the ice, so ice is deforming. So it's coming from the mountains towards the front. And this is really quite fascinating that we can do this from satellites these days. Um, so these colors here, they all show how fast something is moving. The dark, the, the purple colors here, this is very fast motion. The uh, red is a little bit slower, and then it gets slower as you go out. So you can see this ice coming out here of the... Um, uh, the, the mountains going through the sewer glacier, through that throat here into the lobe of the sit lane and, uh, and, and filling it up. Uh, there is another contributor here. There's fast glaciers coming down Icy Bay and so on. But when we look at 
just how much ice is coming out of the mountains to keep this slope here alive, so to speak, um, we see that this gets quite complicated. What I did here is I just picked a velocity time series at all of these points, blue, green, red, and orange, and I plotted it against time. So this goes back a little over 10 years. And what you see when you, especially when you go up here, you see a strong, you see rapid flow. These are meters per year. So here is about a mile a year, a mile of displacement. So what you see, there's a strong seasonality. So the glacier goes faster in the summer, slower in the winter. This is kind of what we'd expect. Actually, um, it goes it goes slowest in the or fastest in the spring when water really first starts uh, being produced from melt, and then it slows down a bit and speeds up again and so on. But what we see is sometimes the the glacier does something. It's called a surge, which is a really rapid advance. And we see that all of a sudden the glacier is going more than double, sometimes in some glaciers, almost 10 times as fast as usual. And down here uh, at the red spots where the ice was barely moving at all, all of a sudden it's moving at over a mile a year. So it does very rapid advances. So this makes the story a bit more complicated. Um, this is an animation of that from, again, from satellite images. And what you see is uh, if you just put a time lapse of these images together, you see how around 2020 and 2021, this ice really started getting activated all the way down here. This is fountain stream. So there was a rapid advance that reached all the way out here. Um, and now that's pretty much done again. But that leads to very heavy crevassing. This is a, a picture of how it looks like near fountain stream or how it did um, two years ago. Uh, or one year ago, one and a half years ago in the summer. And so you have heavy crevassing. This is a glacier that you might have been able to cross on foot um, a few years earlier, um, but there is not really any prayer of doing that in this state. I'm showing you some other pictures near the front um, because this turns out to be a pretty important part of the story. And this is the fact that we see trees and entire forests growing on the ice. This is really quite surprising. And often when I talk about the, the, the glacier people, this, this, is, this is the things that, that people cat, catch on the most or get interested in most. And the way you see it, that ice actually uh, is under these trees is when you happen to find a place like this where there's a cliff. So this is a cliff of, this looks a, a little dirty, but you, if you scraped away at this, you would just see clean ice underneath it. And on top of it um, are trees. And as you can see in the picture here on the right, often full grown trees. This is a picture from the air. If you were out in here, you would see tall trees sitting right on the land. But then occasionally the land collapses, you get karst features. So these are melt features where ice cliffs, all of these dark things here are ice cliffs. They're dark because they're just covered in in uh, small dirt particles, um, but they're mostly ice. What you see at the front is you kind of see a transition from where ice becomes covered in, in dirt. You can see ice cliffs here. This dirt cover is not necessarily very thick. This is probably in most cases less than a foot thick, but once it becomes stagnant and doesn't move around watch, much then in uh, along the coast of Alaska, we have such a dynamic environment that it really, quickly gets colonized by plants, first shrubs, and then later trees. Here's another example. This is all the way out at the coast by the Sitkagi Bluffs, and the arrow points to various locations along this, um, what looks like a peninsula here, but it's just this ridge that goes out towards the ocean. And you see in these places, you see full-grown forest. You would have no idea that you're actually walking still on top of a glacier, technically. This is a particularly interesting example of one of uh, our grad students climbing into an ice cave in the middle of this forest. We think this forest is really quite important for the glacier because once trees grow on ice, the ice underneath it is very well protected from melt. So there's almost no change in the surface elevation of ice when it's uh, covered in when it's covered in debris, it already reduces it quite a bit, but when it's covered in vegetation, it goes almost to zero. So that is 
to us, part of the explanation why that glacier is still out here and hasn't retreated is because the vegetation out here protects the ice so much. And the effects that are now interesting and that we're starting to look into more because we don't understand quite who's going to win here is whether the water is going to start eating away into here. Sure looks like it in this picture, doesn't it? Like the water is starting to make connections here all the way out to the ocean. And if that water can eat away at that tree covered ice, then get access to the clean ice, then retreats could happen quite uh, quickly. You can get um, calving of ice, breaking of ice into the water, and it being then washed out to the ocean and so on. So I want to pass it on to Kristen now, who um, specialty is to communicate how how all these findings that we have, all these science findings, we tend to go home and then write them up into uh, into scientific journals. But of course, we also want to communicate what we learn to the to the um, broader public and to people like you, to local people. And uh, so Kristen's going to talk a little bit um, about the science of science communication and how we pass on what we found to, to the broader public. As Martin shared, I'm really interested in how we communicate about changing glaciers. And this topic has fascinated me because glaciers are often used to communicate about climate change. You know, they're, they're visual, they're stunning. It's easy to understand the relationship between warmer temperatures and ice. And so we see some examples here from the news, from documentary films, from magazines, from social media, of how glaciers are used to communicate about a changing environment. And one project that I worked on um, in my prior career as a science communicator was this project where I collaborated with um, scientists who study glaciers, um, ecologists, uh, ocean scientists, to try to summarize what some of the key drivers are of change across the whole ecosystem that spans from the ice field down to oceans, down to the water that runs off from those glaciers, into the coastal environment. And it was this figure um, that was one of the reasons um, why Martin reached out to me when we started this project together, um, because there was a, a, a potential to try to understand, you know, how the glacier um, would look, how the Malaspina Glacier or Sick Plain would look in a range of different future scenarios. And so one of the things that we decided to do for this project is to work with a visual artist to create art that helps communicate the science. And so over the course of the next year, we'll be working on visualizations of what Sick Plain Malaspina might look like in the future. We're working on some illustrations that show hidden processes under the rock and ice. And then we might also be creating some 3D models to show what the bedrock actually looks like underneath the ice. And to show some of the ways that we've been experimenting with how best to communicate this work, this is a, a really interesting um, prototype that our team has worked on. So as Martin mentioned previously, Malspina has a lot of ice. And when you take that ice and think about the water equivalent, this square sitting on top of the glacier is the water equivalent of this massive lobe of ice. And so to put this into perspective, we can zoom in even further. And here we see a picture of the Eiffel Tower in comparison to that body of water. And if we zoom in even further, we can see an Alaska Airlines uh, jet in comparison to that body of water. And so these are some of the things that our team is working on. And you know, we'd love to learn more about the questions that, you know, you're curious about um, and whether we can find ways to communicate about that um, and, and share that information from our research with you. In addition, 
I'm working on a project to try to better understand how these images of changing glaciers affect the way that people think about the broader issue of global climate change. And so, as I mentioned before, receding glaciers are frequently used to show the effects of climate change. Um, and so we're gonna conduct an online study to ask people what they think about these kinds of images um, and you know, how does that affect the way that they think about this global issue? So as we wrap up this presentation, we're really curious to understand more um, of the questions that you have. Um, so please reach out to us if you have any questions about this research, about Sitclain. Um, we are excited to share what we're learning um, with, with anybody. So get in touch. And so in conclusion, just thank you um, from all of us um, who presented and the rest of our team at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, the University of Montana, the University of Arizona, and the National Park Service.